by grace through faith. Uh, let's pray and then we'll jump right in. <laughs> Father, I want to thank you for another opportunity to get into your word, God. I thank you that we have it. So many people around the world uh, don't have it, God. I know we take it for granted, but we have your word. We got it in so many different versions on our phones, written Bibles, all of that, God. Help us to treasure it, God. But as we jump into your word today, Father, I pray that the truth that Paul wanted to impress upon those early believers would be impressed upon our hearts as well, God, because it's the truth that you want us to know. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. 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 By grace through faith. All right, so let's just read through those verses. We're reading through verses 1 through 10, and then we will jump back in and pull it apart a little bit, all right? So Paul says, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So this chapter here starts with Paul saying, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. And so I want us to take a quick look at this video. Um, it's a former gang member. His name is Isaiah Blancas. And uh, as we continue to think through what Paul means by being dead in our trespasses and sins. El Paso, Texas, 1991. It had been only a few weeks since Isaiah Blancas' father ran off with another woman, leaving his family behind. I love my dad a lot. And um, to me, he was... Um... It was like my everything, and so when he left it, yeah, it, it, it broke me. Now, Isaiah was on the streets, kicked out by his mother, and left to find his way alone in the gang riddled projects. Isaiah was only nine. It was terrifying. So I had a lot of anger in me. Um, I just didn't care no more. My heart turned cold. To survive, he slept wherever he could find shelter, ate out of garbage cans, and, for a while, avoided the gangs roaming the streets. One night, they caught him out alone, beat him with a bat, and dumped him off at a hospital, bruised and bloodied. That's when I made up in my mind, I'm gonna be one of the most violent gang members El Paso has ever seen. At the age of 14, Isaiah joined the same gang that nearly killed him. He had embraced a lifestyle rooted in violence, fighting, robbery, substance abuse, and the acceptance that came with it. We were all like family. Even though there was treachery and, you know, even our own homeboys, our own friends would backstab us and stuff like that, we still considered each other family and we would die for each other. The next five years will be a blur of crime and violence as Isaiah became one of the gang's most vicious members, earning him the nickname, The Stabber. I became what, what, what I really yearned to be, which was a feared gang member, someone that was really respected. By 19, Having served time for stabbing six people from another gang, Isaiah felt he was trapped in a world in which he would never escape. You know, my hope was gone. I, I had already accepted that I was gonna die in prison or, or die in the streets. Then, in 2001, he broke probation when he was arrested for breaking and entering. Right back in jail, it wasn't long before, again, Isaiah started unleashing his anger. And I ended up, um, Doing the same stuff I was always doing. You know, beating people up, breaking people's ribs, you know, inciting fights, riots. A lot more horrible things than that. Things that earned him a year in solitary confinement. Allowed one hour a day outside, 
He'd spend the other 23 hours in a cell. The once tender nine-year-old turned into a hardened, angry man was alone again. I didn't care about myself. If I died, so I didn't care about anyone. I was doing so much wrong, and if I died, then I died. It didn't matter. The only other time he could be out of his cell was to attend religious services every two weeks. Isaiah jumped on the chance to get out of his cell, even though he didn't care about what they had to say. I didn't believe in God, period. I said if there was a loving God, how could he let all this happen to me? What he found there was not what he expected. A female chaplain named Gina, who'd also been forged in the fires of gang life. She addressed him as Weto, a street term for someone with a light complexion. I remember Gina coming right up into my face like this close. She said, you're willing to die for it. You believe in Weto? And she said, um, well, I'm willing to die too, but for God's gang. You know, I, I left that day just thinking, I well, is different. A few weeks later, an inmate overdosed in his cell. As the guard started moving his body out, Gina showed up. She was hugging this guy, crying, praying for him. It, it really blew my mind, you know, because I'd never seen love like that. You know, genuine love for people like us. When Isaiah returned to solitary, his thoughts raced about the man he'd become, thoughts that left him with one question. I was a, a horrible person, someone that didn't deserve grace, someone that didn't deserve love after all the wrong I had done. And I said, could this God really use someone like me that's this broken? At the next service, Isaiah asked Gina the same question. And she said, yes, he will. He will use you for his glory. He came for people like you, for the worst of the worst. And so at that time, I, I, I opened my hands out and, and I said, you know, uh, this God you're talking about loves me. And here I am. And I gave my life to God that day. Isaiah the Stabber was now Isaiah, a transformed, forgiven child of God. As he grew in his faith, Isaiah was also able to forgive his parents. Now, over two decades later, he's married, has four children, and runs a ministry that helps those trapped in a cycle of destruction, addiction, and violence find a better life through faith in Jesus Christ. And I, and I want to let them know about how great my God is and that there is hope in Jesus Christ. Amen. Powerful testimony, um, looking at that. And sometimes when we see a testimony like that and we consider the before Jesus story and the after Jesus story, you know, sometimes we might have a thought that's like, well, at least that wasn't me. I wasn't that bad. You know, like that's a pretty crazy story. And so maybe you can relate to a before Jesus story similar to that. Like life was chaotic. Life was crazy. Stuff just didn't make any sense. But then Jesus steps in, right? Jesus steps in. But when we're thinking about the before Jesus stories, that's not the only kind of before Jesus story that we have, right? Some of you would know C.S. Lewis. He is an author, a theologian, and his before Jesus story looks different from that one. He tried to apply his logic and his intellect and academia to say, you know what, I can figure this God out and somehow it'll make sense and I don't believe in God, I don't even know if he exists, but I'm gonna try to do it this way. And then he meets Jesus. So his before Jesus story looked very much different from Isaiah's, looked a little bit more tame, one could say. Or even as we consider the before story of the Apostle Paul himself who wrote this, the, the Apostle Paul, like he went around killing Christians. He literally went around killing Christians. His Bible studies were to encourage people to go out and kill Christians. But then he met Jesus. So he was this religious zealot all in, but all in for the wrong thing. So his before Jesus story looked completely different from C.S. Lewis's, different from Isaiah's as well. And then even a gentleman by the name of Lee Strobel, maybe you've heard that name, he was a journalist, is a journalist, he's still alive. And he set out to prove that the resurrection was a hoax or it didn't exist because he didn't want to be accountable to a God that says it is true. 
But what he found is as he continued to research this as a professional journalist, he came to the conclusion that the crucifixion, it happened and Jesus really did rise from the dead. So everything else has to be true. And he became a follower of Jesus. So his before Jesus story looked quite different from the others. But sometimes what happens is based on our before Jesus story, we might come to the conclusion that, no, I know that I needed Jesus. But let me tell you who really needed Jesus. <laughs> Sister so-and-so, if you heard her story, if you knew, like, she really needed Jesus. Like, I, I know I needed Jesus, but she really needed Jesus. But this is what Paul says. Paul says, you all were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Every single one of us, every one of us who have put our faith in Jesus Christ, we all have a different before Jesus story. That's just called life. Different things have shaped us. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that when we come to our application points. But I want us to have this in mind. We have to be very careful that we don't start trying to elevate ourselves over other people because our before Jesus story might look a little tamer than somebody else's. Paul says, you were all dead, every single one of you. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. And the word for trespasses means false steps. So the false steps that you were continually and willingly taking apart from God and the sins, which means to miss God's standard or miss the mark, this is how you all willingly lived your life. I don't want to necessarily compare, like, you know, the pre-Jesus story. You all, it doesn't matter what your story looks like. You were all in the same situation. And this is important because Ephesus was a very, very important part of town. It's where all the rich people hung out. It was like the influential uh, marketplace for the whole region in Asia Minor there. And so it's possible that maybe some of them came to this thinking that, you know what, like, I I'm just super cool. Like, I live in Ephesus. Where you live? You live, uh, <laughs> I live in Ephesus. And maybe they were starting to come away with attitudes and Paul saying, but listen, I don't worry about the priest story. Don't worry about how tame it looked or how chaotic it looked. You were all in the same situation. Every single one of them and every single one of us. We were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. And he goes on and he says, you know what? Following the course of this world, following the world's influence, which is Satan's influence in the world, just sort of going along with it. That's the way that we used to walk. Following the prince of the power of the air, following Satan himself. We say, well, no. I, do you know what my last name is? I didn't live like that. Paul's saying, listen, you all were dead. You and I... We all were dead in the trespasses and sins in which we once walked. And then Paul goes on and he says this, Among whom we all once lived in the passions of the flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Now, very important to understand this because Paul just finished saying, you are all in this sinful trespass state prior to coming to Jesus. Paul here then goes further and he says, don't worry, I was there too. He says, and among whom we all once. So Paul's now saying, you know what, it's not just a Gentile issue. It's not just a you issue. It's not just an Ephesians issue. It's an everybody issue, and I'm included. And the implication of him even saying that is the Jewish nations is included. So if you are having conversations with some Jews in Ephesus and they're telling you how special they are over and above you, Paul said, uh-uh. Like, yes, God may have a sovereign plan that included the nation, but when it comes to this trespasses and sin thing, we're all in the same situation together. I'm included. And then he says, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, basically doing what Nike tells us, just do it. Whatever you feel like, just do it. Every single one of us, Paul's saying, lived like that before we came to Jesus. And he says, and we're by nature children of wrath. The phrase literally means uh, children or persons who deserved God's wrath. That's what it means. That's the state that you and I were in. Everybody was in that state before meeting Christ. Those who haven't met Christ and come to faith in Christ are still in that state. 
But he's talking to believers here who have put their faith in Jesus. Maybe they're getting a little haughty. Maybe they're a little pride kicking in. I don't know. But Paul's just making it clear. Let me tell you the state that you were in before you met Jesus. And so our before story, it might be different, right? But our spiritual reality before Christ, absolutely the same. Lost is lost. Lost is lost. That's the situation. But then we come to verse 4, which is some of the most wonderful words that we could ever read. The first two, but God. But God. But God. How many of you here are excited that that statement is there? But God. But God. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And so the whole section here is literally, this verse is 1 to 10. It's actually one sentence again. It's about God. It's about God. This is what God did for you and I. This is the state that we were in, but God. But God. Because of his rich mercy, we having been in a situation where we were dead, like just dead. No ability to, 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 to quicken ourselves and, and get right with God and all the rest of it. And, and even as we went through chapter 1, appreciating that this, it wasn't an accident. God planned all of this out before the beginning of time, before the foundations of the earth. God being rich in his mercy did something about it. And so there are three things that Paul describes that he did because of his rich mercy and his great love. And the first thing he did was make us alive together with Christ. He made us alive together with Christ. Now, it's hard to sort of, I guess, fathom that because we're alive. And so, you know, it's hard to picture being dead. Now, I know that we've been to funerals and the like, not being morbid, but to understand the difference, can't really do it. So I, I was just thinking, like, when Jesus was at the tomb of Lazarus, the Bible doesn't tell us what happened to Lazarus, sick, what have you, but he died. And the persons prepared Lazarus based on the fact that he was dead. If somebody is dead, there are some specific things that you do because they're dead. You wrap them up in that time anyway. You put them in a tomb. They did what was normal for a dead body. What wasn't normal is what Jesus did after the fact, based on the natural thinking and the natural order of things. Jesus comes into a situation, and this body is dead. He has been prepared as any other dead body would be prepared. And Jesus comes and speaks life, speaks to him. Lazarus come out, and life just wells up in him. Like, it's hard to imagine, but, you know, he's wrapped up tight. Like, think of a mummy, and, um, you know, now he's alive, so he's just got to be wriggling. Like, I can't imagine what else. I know it sounds weird. I'm not trying to be flippant. But, like, that's what happens. So what was destined for complete destruction, degradation, etc., was prepared for that purpose. But here comes Jesus and life, literally life comes back into it. And now Jesus said, you got to go cut the, 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 the wraps off him and let him, let him free. Because he was prepared for what the norm was. But what was supernaturally abnormal, if it were, is that Jesus came in and spoke life into a dead situation. So in a very similar way, as surely as Jesus physically came back to life after he was physically dead, it's the same way in which you and I receive spiritual life as we were spiritually dead. And the reality of being dead, again, is that the process begins, which is, well, this is dead. This is what you do with dead things. What happens to spiritually dead people is that they just continue to do what the things of the world and Satan, and eventually, unfortunately, hell is the, the, the plot. So that was the normal process of things until God stepped in and quickened us and gave us spiritual life together with Christ. That's what he did. So that's the first thing that Paul says Jesus did, God did, through Christ. And then he says, by grace you have been saved. By grace you have been saved. 
The second thing that God did is he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It's, it's a powerful concept here and it's hard to grasp. It's one in which we literally just have to accept because it's true truth and this is what God says about his children. Positionally, we sit with Jesus Christ in the heavenly places. In other words, positionally and relationally, we are seen by God the Father as beloved children, just like Jesus. Positionally, Jesus' status as beloved child in perfect relationship with God the Father is our status. Our status is wrapped up in Jesus' status. That's just the, Colossians talks about the fact that we're in God, that we're in Christ, and Christ is in God, and we're, like, it's just the way that it is. We positionally are represented by Jesus Christ. And so relationally, in terms of how well the Father perfectly loves the Son and how well they've been interacting from eternity past and how they see each other, positionally, that's how God sees us as his children. But it's all through Christ. The third thing that Paul says here, verse 7, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So it's, it's, it's crazy to think about this, but God hasn't yet finished showing us his immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. He hasn't finished doing that. So sometimes, even for me, you know, i got a colorful story. I'm not going to go through it all. But I'm thinking to myself, and maybe you can think like this as well. God, I know what you did for me. I remember the day that you saved me. I remember the day that you changed my life. I didn't dream I had purpose, but you convinced me, showed me that, and now you're continuing to do it on a daily basis. I don't know how you do it. I don't know why you do it, but I'm so thankful that you did it. In a sense... I sometimes come to the conclusion like, you know what, God, that's enough. I'm good. Because even after I die, I get to be with Jesus. That's phenomenal. But guess what? That's not where it ends from God's point of view. That's all true. But God hasn't yet finished, and I guess it will take all eternity for him to do it, to show us how rich he is in his grace and mercy and how much he loves us in Christ Jesus. He's getting in the coming ages that he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. It, it's similar to what Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy. He writes um, chapter 2. I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Now, again, this is me speculating. I'm not suggesting this is how Paul thought. But again, I have to remember, Paul used to go around killing Christians. He met Jesus, Jesus changed his life, and now he's the apostle Paul going around telling people about Jesus. Like, I'm like, Paul, you got in. You shouldn't be waiting and asking for anything else. Based on what you used to do, like he said, you, that's got to be enough. You shouldn't be expecting anything else. Now, Paul's expectation doesn't come from his humanity. It comes from what God says he has in store for him. So he says, even after I finish living my life on earth, God is going to have some crowns that he wants to give me. I don't know why. But he's rich in mercy. He saved me. He changed my life. He's made me useful. I get to see Jesus. But on top of all of that, he actually has some crowns he wants to give me. And for all of us who long for his appearing. The salvation message is, yes, we are secure in Christ. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. We're secure. But it just gets better and better and better. And better. I know that life is hard here, and one day this life as we know it will end. But for the believer, we have the hope, the guaranteed hope of the inheritance of one being with Jesus Christ. And then on top of that, like mansions and this and that, and then riches that somehow is going to show us in eternity to come, how rich he is in his mercy. He wants to shower us with that through Christ and it's just like this unbelievable story that just keeps going on and on and on. But this is how rich God is. This is how God sees us 
as he sees us in Christ. That's how God does it. No, that's not to suggest that we should stay in a place of, well, God, I didn't deserve it. Where was me? Nobody deserved it. But that's not to stop us or it shouldn't stop us from longing for what God says, I want you to have because you are my child. And sometimes, I'll be honest, sometimes that happens to me sometimes. Like, God, I don't, de- I know, I, I don't deserve salvation. But like, then you want to give me this and you want to give me that and I get to see you and it just goes on and on. Immeasurable. That word immeasurable, it literally just means that the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us, you and I, followers of Jesus, his children in Christ Jesus. It's an amazing thought. It's an amazing thought. And then we come to verse 8 and 9, very familiar verses. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And so Paul elaborates here on what he already said in verse 5. He said, "By grace, for by grace you have been saved. And, um, you know, again, don't know the disposition necessarily of the hearers. Um, but Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, has to write this. Maybe, again... It was getting to their, 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 their minds and they were getting haughty or, or whatever. But Paul said, listen, lest you forget anything else, this whole plan of salvation, it wasn't yours. It, you're not that smart. Like, you're not, and I don't think he's talking down to them. He's just telling them the reality of it. It's by grace you have been saved, through faith. There's that dual thing again, right? God's grace, our faith. We've got to leave it to God's sovereignty to figure all of it out. But that's how God designed it, and God's sovereign and powerful enough to manage all of that. But it said it's by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not your own doing. Lest you think your job had something to do with it, lest you think your last name had something to do with it, it didn't have anything. You couldn't do anything to work out this plan. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. No one may boast. It's really interesting that Paul would have to write that to this church, right? Um, you would think, and it, this is for us as well, you would think that we would naturally understand that there's nothing to boast about. But if Paul wrote this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, you know what that meant? Some persons were boasting about it. That's what it means. He had to address something. Don't know where it came from. Don't know who it was or the rest of it. But some, for whatever reason, were coming away with, well, I deserve to be in. And Paul said, no, 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 no. You can't boast about that. In our context, maybe it's, well, my Christian heritage goes back three, four generations. Praise God for that. But so what? (laughs) Can't boast in it. It's still God's plan. We thank God for that, but we don't boast in it as if, like, well, I was supposed to be in. God, I'm going to wait all this time for you to notice me. Like, can't do that, right? It's a gift. It's a gift. And then, last verse we're going to look at, Paul says this, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. A note here from the Bible Knowledge Commentary says this, Paul describes here why this salvation is not from man or by his works. The reason is that salvation is God's workmanship. Now, the idea with workmanship is that it's it's his masterpiece. Now, this is God's word. So when one considers how splendid the world is and the power that God has, used when he spoke and everything just came. I mean, there are still things we're figuring out about space and galaxies and animals and this, that, and the other. Like, the world, in a sense, is a masterpiece, I would say. And God does say that if you want to know more about me, check out the world. So that's there. You'll find that. But this is a a different word, and it's more intimate. It's like, this is the plan that I was developing all the time. In other words, like if you're creating a masterpiece, if you're doing your best, it's not something that just happens, right? You don't just wake up one day and say, you know what? Yeah. No, it takes planning, time. No, God's God. I don't know why he chose to use time in that way because he's God. He didn't have to. He could have snapped it and, you know, he's God. But it speaks of the intentionality 
the length of time, the purpose, the plan, and all the rest of it. We are his workmanship. And so believers are God's workmanship because they have been created, a work only God can do in Christ Jesus. So if we want to bring some of our own stuff to the table and start boasting, it's just like, well, it's, it's impossible because there's a masterpiece that you didn't think about that is being created by God and you're a part of it, but it didn't come from you. It's not you, it's not, but we are a masterpiece created in Jesus Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in. God's workmanship is not achieved by good works, but it is to result in good works. So always keep that in mind. You know, God does want us to live out and work out what it looks like to follow Jesus. But we don't work hard to become children of God. But we're workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. As we get ready to close, I just want to reflect on three questions. The first is this. What story do you most relate to? And again, I'm referring back to the video and sort of the other stories that I was just summarizing. Is it that Isaiah story who is like ex gang and maybe there's some stuff, you know, that people don't even know about, but it is your before Jesus story. It is what it is. Or maybe you relate more to like a C.S. Lewis, which is, you know what, God's irrelevant. I try to live my life to prove that he wasn't. I'm pretty smart. Everyone's told me that I always got the best grades, so that was enough to suggest that God wasn't relevant, and that's my before Jesus story. I wasn't as drama-filled as Isaiah, you know, but that was my, that was my space, right? Or maybe the Apostle Paul, you know, caught up in religion. Die hard, but die hard for the wrong thing. Thinking that I was doing it for God, but actually hindering God. But then, met Jesus. That's Paul's before Jesus story. Maybe you can relate to that one a little bit. Or maybe Lee Strobel mentioned him, right? God doesn't exist, and I'm going to prove it, right? Maybe it's that inquisitive disposition that you have. I think I'm a little bit like that. It's my science in me, right? I like to try to figure stuff out, and God's had to encourage me in some ways and shut some other stuff down. But that's my natural disposition. Or maybe you're one of those more quiet folk, you know, no one really knows a lot about a lot. That's fine. I'm not suggesting we need to put our stories on Facebook. But sort of going along with the flow. My before Jesus story was not so much drama. I was just doing what I do. And, you know, maybe that's sort of your story. But I want to encourage you with what Paul says, which is simply this. Regardless of our pre-Jesus story, we were all in the same situation, in dire need to be rescued. So you, you can't boast in that. You can't say, you know, I deserve to be in or, or whatever. Sometimes we can have the tendency, so I've experienced this, okay, I've experienced this. In the church where, based on the pre-Jesus story, we, we treat the church like it's a, um, a, an airplane, right, with first class seats and second class seats. You're in the airplane, that's cool, you're in the airplane, but you're a second-class um, Christian, right? You know, I'm, I'm a first-class Christian. You're a second-class Christian. But the picture that Paul presents here is we're all in the same airplane, and the plane goes down, and now it's in the water, right? And the rescuers come. They're not coming and asking, well, what's your last name? Or how much money do you make? Or like how many generations has your family been into this thing? I'm not asking all that. Everyone's in the same situation. Just help me. And how crazy would it be for persons in the water hearing a rescuer ask somebody else that question? They'd be like, what kind of rescuer is this? Like we're all in the same 
situation. I just want to be rescued. That's what Paul says. Now, the reason why I want us to think about this, you might be asking yourself, okay, okay, okay. We have to be very careful when it comes to the unity of the church. When we see people as simply according to their pre-Jesus story, we can have an attitude that says, well, I'm so glad I'm not like them. But Paul would say, yes, you were. Your story might be different, but you were in the same need as the other person. There's no difference. No, that's not to be uh, flimping and say, you know, there are consequences and impacts that one can see and all the rest. Yeah, I get all of that. But from God's perspective in my family, ain't no first class Christians and second class. There is the book that I'm reading. It's, um, uh, who wrote the Message Bible? Eugene Peterson. Sort of his biography and his writing through. And it's one chapter that really blessed me. He was trying to help pastors to understand how important it is to see your congregation as children of God first and persons who have some challenges that still need to be worked out second. Sometimes what happens is we can see people and the brokenness first and figure like we somehow have to fix it or we, we, we are forced to think in this way or that way. And he's saying, no, you can't do that because God sees them in Christ first. Now, there's some stuff. We don't ignore stuff. And it's similar because when you go to the book of 1 Corinthians, both books, right? That was one book. Like, if you read through that book, you could come to the conclusion that these people ain't Christians. You see how they're behaving. They got sex all up in the church and people are getting hot having orgies over her, and, all, and they're calling themselves Christians. No, Paul is not making or, or, or giving them a pass on things that need to change. But you know how he addresses them? From the first verse of both of those letters, dearly beloved saints. So I'm saying, well, 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 how is that possible? Like, don't you see that? And Paul isn't ignoring that stuff. But he's seeing them in the way that God sees them. It's very important for a pastor. Still learning that. Thank God for all of you. But I really appreciated his perspective on that. You don't ignore stuff. But you got to see people like God sees people. His church. And we have to do that for each other. So I, I don't care what the story is, the pre-Jesus story. What excites me is that you met Jesus. And when you met Jesus, you became a full-fledged child of God. With me, when I met Jesus, I became a full-fledged child of God with you. And we are both, all of us, wrapped up in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's who we are. Position, that's who we are. And yes, we do have some stuff that we got to work through. And Paul actually gets down to that later on in this book. But this is so important. So that's why I want us to think about it. When it comes to the unity of Christ, stories matter. The grace of God in their stories matter. I'm not saying we just forget about them and act as if they don't. No, because sometimes hearing a testimony like that guy Isaiah or some of the testimonies, they encourage us. Praise God for that. But we have to be careful. I've experienced this. Maybe you have as well. It's like, well, mm -mm, that ain't my story. I'm glad. No, 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 no. Child of God. That's what the label is. Child of God. Child of God. Second question I want us to look at is simply this. How does knowing the extent of God's grace impact you? Like, how does it impact you? When you think of the grace of God and how he has applied it to your life and my life, how does it impact? How does it move you to respond to God? Because if it doesn't do anything, then maybe there's something in the way that we need to look. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he was a German pastor in, in Germany, uh, World War II, Nazi campaign, all of the rest of it, and he faithfully proclaimed God's word, and he coined, others have used it as well, but this idea of cheap grace, and, and, and it's the idea of saying, well, yeah, I'm, I'm in, right, but don't I get to do what I want? Like, and this is sort of where this question is good. Understanding the grace of God, how does that impact us and move us to respond to it? It should move us in some way. Everyone's story is different. I get that. 
But that's, that's the question. And I think that's what Paul is wanting those early believers and us to really appreciate. Like, I mean, if we really grasp how dire our situation was and God extended his love towards us, not as an afterthought, not as a, oh, well, come on. Mm -mm. He thought about all of this stuff before the foundations of the earth. How does that impact us? That's the question I want to ask you. And then the last question is simply this. Are you walking in the path that God has prepared for you? Press 10 just said, for we are his workmanship. It didn't say we might be or, you know, it's a remote chance that we could be. It said we are. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ and learn for salvation, you are a child of God. All of these things are who we are. There are blessings that God has for us in the heavenly realms. We were talking about that. And this is how those blessings are appropriated as we understand it and as we live it out. But the question then becomes, if I am part of this masterpiece, and I am, am I walking in the thing that God's called me to do? No. There's no Bible verse that says this is who I'm supposed to marry. Or, this is the next job for me. And I, I got all of that, right? That'd be kind of cool if it did, but it doesn't work like that. But it's so obvious all through Scripture that we are taught to draw near to God in a personal way. And when we do that, some of, and I say some, I'm realistic, some of the questions that we have start to go away because we're at least walking in the places God wants us to walk having the conversations God wants us to have, dealing with the things in us that he wants us to deal with. And then some of those other questions become much more manageable. So that's the question. Are you walking in the path that God has prepared for you? So let's close our eyes. Uh, we're done. I'm just going to ask you to sit maybe for 30 seconds or so. Reflect on that. Wherever you are, whatever your story is, reflect on that. And then at the end, I am going to do a simple altar call if God has impacted your heart in any of these areas, just going to ask you to stand in a minute. I'm just giving you a heads up. But right now, let's just quietly sit in this space and respond to God in however way he is leading you. anything on your heart. Maybe it's, God, I have to be real careful that I don't try to elevate myself into a first class seat as if I'm better than one of your children because our stories before you were different. Maybe that's something that the Lord's impressed upon you or God, now that I'm really appreciating just your grace, God, and just the way in which you planned it out, you extended it, God, help me to respond in the areas of my life that you want me to respond in, even in the difficult areas, or especially in the difficult areas, I should say. And God, would you help me to walk in the path that you have for me? It's not a mistake. I didn't fall into this. I didn't come into a trap door and say, hey, God, it's me. No, you called me. You redeemed me. You drew me. You want me. Help me to walk in the path that you have for me. If God's impressed any of those on your heart, would you just stand? I'm just going to pray. I'm standing. Um, you know, I, I need God. And I really want these things to really be impressed upon me in an even more significant way. Um, anybody else? Just, just stand real quick. Just going to pray, and then we will be out of here. Father, it's by your grace, God, that we've been saved. It's your grace, God, unmerited favor that you saw fit based on your sovereignty, your love, your mercy, your grace 
to extend to us. And you did it, God, in eternity past before the foundations of the earth, before we were even a thought in our parents' minds. So, Father, none of this is an accident, God. Us being your children doesn't surprise you. We're part of your workmanship, God. We're part of your masterpiece, God. And that is an amazing thought in and of itself, Father. And even as we seek to grasp that, Father, one day we're going to be with you, Jesus, for all eternity. And even then, you're going to continue to extend immeasurable grace and kindness to us. Like, what is that like, God? But I want to thank you that all of those things are possible and ours because they come through Christ and he is the one who represents us. So, Father, I pray that you would help us to respond to you, Father, based on the grace that you've extended to us, God. Not out of duty, God, but just out of love and passion that says, wow, God. And, Father, I pray that you would help us to be a unified church, a church that sees each other as trophies of your grace, God. Persons, yes, that need to work on some things and sanctification is still what's got to happen until we see you, Jesus. But, Father, help us to see each other as you see us, God. And I pray, God, that you would give us the strength and confidence to walk in the path that you have prepared for us, God. Help us not to try to figure it out or at least craft a new path or figure that, you know what, God, your path isn't so good. Let me help you out, God. Help us to get to know you more and watch you lead us directly to where it is that you would help us, God. Father, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your power. I thank you for your love, God. And I thank you, Father, that we get to do life together at this church. So thank you, God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. That is our service for today. And um, next week, we're going to stay at it. Uh, next week, just as a quick heads up, it is uh, Black History Month. And so we're recognizing, as many others are, just um, some of the things that have taken place and some of the things that we get to celebrate as we continue to grow and unify. So next week, we'll um, just little snippets. Looking forward to a powerful interview um, that you'll see next week and, and just some ideas as we talk about unity and, and celebrating and recognizing how it is that Blacks have made a specific impact in the past and how we all need to continue to do that as children of God. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Make sure you say hello to somebody, and uh, we'll see you next week.